Hey, today we're really lucky to have uh, Dr. Tom Galvin. He's the prof associate professor of resource management here at the Army War College. He's going to talk about, uh, you can see the title of this topic, the Towards Community Impact Disorder Events Management. Frequently, people think management is different than leadership. Tom's going to tell you why they need to be done together. So, Tom, over to you. And why they're one and the same. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for uh, for being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob, for that uh, introduction. Uh, my purpose here, I'm going to be spending probably 80% of my talk on defense management and maybe 20% about the community of the idea of a community of practice. What I want to do is kind of inspire you based on when we think about all of the uh, presentations that have been given so far today, many of them have surrounded all of the difficulties and therefore the skills and competencies needed for leaders to make better decisions or talk about leadership character by which they face or be able to deal with tough decisions. What I'm going to talk about is a whole slate of decision making contexts that perhaps get underrepresented in senior leader education. Some of these are ones in which we do have very robustly dealt with in our curriculum at the Army War College. Some of them not as much as we would like simply due to time. But these are all related to the business end of running the defense enterprise. And uh, unfortunately, some of the challenges that we have faced on, on the faculty when it comes to talking about leadership and management as being kind of two sides of a similar coin is that we, there is a cultural attitude towards management, which is not generally favorable. Okay, I start with this particular quote from James March, uh, famous from the Graduate School of Industrial Administration at Carnegie Mellon, who said leadership involves plumbing as well as poetry, and I'm basically here to talk about the plumbing. <laughs> okay, you know, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the poetry today, but when we talk about leadership, what do we think about? What do people think about? especially those in uniform. They think about people, men and women of action, who inspire, who lead, who engage, all of the things that a lot of the presentations have been about. Management, on the other hand, we're thinking of something else. We're thinking of bureaucrats, naysayers, people who use arcane language or just uh, self-centered. They're the ones who put toxic in front of toxic leadership. Okay, that's one view. Another view is the way in which those who work specifically in the Pentagon, but anywhere else working the business side of the military has a whole arcane set of language that they use uh, that is indecipherable to anybody who isn't working there. And so you have this sort of separation between say the Pentagon or the head shed or the, uh, the puzzle palace and everybody else. But kidding aside, I mean, you know, part of what I want to do is to help with rebranding this idea because there is a lot of very serious and important decisions that we face on the business end that needs attention. And so it is, what are the skills or how do you apply some of these skills and competencies we've been talking about towards a whole different set of decision-making contexts that our senior leaders on the enterprise side deal with routinely? I'm going to put a little bit of urgency into it and talk about current events. And this is uh, what I've been getting the last couple of years. I'm, I work in uh, one of the special programs here at the, the Army War College where we have resident students who get the chance to go out and be consultants to uh, major Army Command Headquarters, Combatant Command Headquarters, solving uh, large scale, real world, heavily business oriented type problems. We look at what's going on, for example, in Russia and Ukraine. And some of the conversations that we've had this year have been on looking at critically at what's been going on on the Russia side. They weren't quite as ready, weren't quite as capable as many thought. They're dealing with riots and they're trying to institute a draft, all of this sort of thing. Okay. This the question then comes down, you know, looking inward. Is the US military ready for the next big war? To what extent are we prepared not to experience problems like what is being faced there right now? And uh, there's this is a real serious issue. Um, I have some uh, pictures here. 
hearkening back to World War II, when we think about the industrial base, the ability to mobilize the nation in order to fight the war, okay? Be able to, you know, Rosie the River, um, the excess capacity, access to raw materials, the ability to produce stuff. Um, civil defense, the home front, the ability to uh, have a robust number of people being air raid wardens and all that sort of thing. Um, austerity measures. COVID taught us quite a bit about where we stand right now, about the ability to um, ration or, you know, uh, be able to control the expenditure of resources to make sure fighting forces have enough of what they need. We also have uh, issues, uh, lots of questions about supply chains, how dependent we are on the global markets for certain things like rare earth metals and the like. Okay. Then we have new problems. I mean, you know, I'm only revisiting the World War II ones. We've got new ones. We've got new domains that all present their own ethical challenges. You know, the use of uh, uh, in the cyber side, ethics and artificial intelligence. I'm looking at the chaplain here who's raised that question more than twice. You know, um, how much are we going to be comfortable with uh, lay, uh, allowing AI to make some of our decisions for us? Hmm. The strength or the, uh, um, the health of the all volunteer force, current recruiting challenges, very serious business. Will we be able to have enough people just to man the army that we have? Much less if we have the next big war and we have to mobilize the nation like we did then in, in World War II, would we be able to do it? I mean, what good is selective service if you don't have enough people to make it worthwhile? Um, and of course, fake news, information, disinformation, misinformation. You know, a lot of what we talk about with uh, character and ethics assumes that uh, you have an environment that is conducive to a meritorious or a rational way of looking at things. And we're asking our leaders to be able to navigate a whole different information environment. And sometimes when we do development, we do education, we try to take all of these different disparate problems and separate them into little boxes as discrete entities. How do we solve this problem? How do we solve that problem? Of course, we know intuitively that they all overlap. They're all com um, complex, they're adapting, they're interrelated, and it's hard. And that's the, net, that's the environment that we need our, lead, our senior leaders as business leaders to be able to run the enterprise. Okay, so, you know, yeah, it's, it's about mission and people, of course. And so when I, this is why I kind of look at leadership and management as two sides of the same coin. Yeah, you know, however it is that you want to describe them as separate, they really are, it, you can't do one without the other, is, is sort of our, our view. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about specifically the decision spaces, okay? Some of these are ones that we've embedded in the course, and we can introduce some that uh, perhaps uh, we don't deal with as much. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one, the legal foundation narrative. And this is one which is rooted in stakeholder relationships. Okay, And I think I saw several presentations that try to uh, develop leaders to handle stakeholder, uh, to basically manage their stakeholders or engage with stakeholders. But I want to take a step further. All right. This narrative basically operates as follows. You start with the stakeholder requirements, whether it's put down in law, such as this particular example with the uh, various responsibilities of the chairman. Okay. So what does the organization do? They create a process or a system or a system of systems, some sort of a structure that says this is how we're going to meet the responsibility and answer back to the stakeholder. Okay. This has a civil military flavor to it, but also think about the same thing at echelon, service, the service major commands, you know, higher organization to lower organization. It's, it goes uh, throughout. But here's where I, I take this a little bit further. On the one hand, you could, we could talk about this as if the purpose of our senior leaders is to be able to turn the crank and be able to spit out the reports and answer back. What about redesigning the system? Okay. What about looking critically at what is being asked 
and adapting what information you have, what information you can get to give better answers. Um, inspiration for that thought is uh, kind of like how Rumsfeld challenged a lot of the reports going back to Congress. Why are we giving them these reports? Those are the kind of questions that uh, perhaps anybody in the business leadership side should be asking. Okay, this stakeholder management exacerbates or uh, irritates or however you want to say it, these tensions. This is this is perhaps a subset of the, all of the sorts of tensions that business, the, the enterprise side of leadership faces. And some of these are paradoxical. They can never be resolved permanently. You can come up with an answer now that somehow satisfies, for example, the joins and service requirement, looking at the fourth level down, capabilities. Okay. But at some point, the tension between the join and the service environments is going to cause that solution to no longer work. And then you have to start all over. And a lot of people don't like revisiting old decisions. Okay. Let me give you another one, which is uh, kind of has more of an assembly line feel, uh, assembly line feel, feel to it. Um, I'll get there in a second, but this is this is encapsulated in what really no kidding is the inspiration for my acronym suit slide. This is a placemat we actually gave to students about 10 years ago. Okay, because this is this is what we thought good defense management education was. We needed to get them attuned to speaking the language of the Pentagon. And uh, yeah, there, you can't read what's on the bottom of the slide. It's hundreds of processes and systems. How do they all come together? Well. The way that we would explain it is there you can group these activities into major movements. And ultimately, the purpose is to take what is strategic and operational requirements. What's the strategy? And at the end, produce combat ready forces, which includes those forces that we already have and those forces that we have to develop. And that's what all the boxes in the middle mean. So in this particular narrative, yeah, again, part of the answer is you got to be able to get senior leaders to turn the crank and say, all right, we got to translate those strategies into requirements and act on those requirements and et cetera, et cetera, all the way to the end. But again, we also need the critical eye. As we develop a uh, capability, how do we know that uh, we're developing that new capability the way that it should, that it's going to work once it's fielded at the under end, other end. When do we know when to stop a capability that is flagging? Or capability development that is flagging? When do we stop the assembly line, pull it off, and try to put something else in? Those are hard decisions because you're talking about potentially losing significant investment every time you do that. And uh, Secretary Gates talked about the uh, the difficulties they had with trying to cancel programs. Okay. Then you have the resourcing narrative. Uh, we look, in this narrative, this is focused on the distribution of money. Although really it's called resources and there's people involved, there's risk. Obviously risk is on the slide, but it's ultimately money. Where does the budget go? And what happens when a senior leader says something like, readiness is number one and there is no other number one priority? What impact does that have on the other two buckets of money that you're paying, paying uh, out of the budget? Modernization or future capabilities or force structure, which is a cost of manpower, largely. Well, what happens is that uh, every all of the programs are in those other two ends of the triangle suddenly start casting themselves or rebranding themselves as readiness. So this narrative is really not about money. It's about communication. How you communicate priorities. That's uh, and, and making your communication stick. Now, here's some others that perhaps we could use a little bit more attention to because uh, this is this is a, a challenge but you know when we start talking about human dimension issues yes leadership has a very very big part of this 
When we talk about unwanted behaviors, climate problems, workplace climate problems, um, you name it, there's a lot of leadership that has to be involved. Leadership giving direction, leadership character, setting the example, all of that sort of thing. But at the enterprise level, there's another side to this. There are all of these levers that on the enterprise side is, is available to decision makers to try to help with um, help commanders, enable them to be able to uh, set the climate, okay? And a lot of these get used quite a bit. Like we created structures such as sharp offices and sharp experts, MOSs or skill identifiers, whatever. Okay, uh, we we do all of these sorts of things, and the question comes down to how do we know that they work? Okay, what what really is the best way to measure the success or the utility of some of, of, of pulling some of these levers on the enterprise side that make things better for the uh, for the military as a whole? Then there's organizational design. One of those levers that I showed was organizational structures. Well, there's a there's a whole another nuance to that. Divi dividing the work, who does what. How much of that do you need? Where do you put it? So we think about it in terms of where do we put units scattered around the globe, uh, commands, what have you. It also applies to headquarters. Like I wrote a case study about, uh, I think it was seven years ago now, about uh, the formation of the United States Africa Command and all of the challenges that it had with figuring out what are the proper roles and missions. So when we talk about a, a, an important business decision, where does Africa Command or where did Africa Command fit with all of the other commands that were like it? And how did we ensure that the rest of the uh, organization was, was able to continue to function and interface with that command? So with that, you know, this is this is a almost an easy button for some of the hard uh, decisions. If we have a problem we can't solve, let's create a new organization to fix it. And then the question becomes, well, is it really the right way to go about it? Should it, should it be a separate organization? If it's a separate organization, how does it interface with everybody else? Should it be a temporary working group instead or a task force? We do a lot of task force, talent management task force, which is supposed to go away when the task is over, but sometimes these things linger, okay? How do we know that creating a new organization is the best way to go? What is What are the opportunity costs based on where you're going to take resources away from to create this new organization? That's been a, a, a question hanging over Africa's head ever since it was formed. How do we know? And then lastly, the profession narrative, which is basically the profession against the bureaucracy and the moral compass. Okay. So when we talk about uh, this narrative, how do we know that a, a business decision is right or wrong? How do we help leaders navigate two competing uh, uh, options of which neither are particularly good at? The solution is not going to be durable, as I said before. And there's, you know, no matter what they do, there's going to be harm done to the organization. Some part of the organization. So this this whole aspect, you know, all of these different narratives come together, and different parts of the organ, the different parts of the enterprise, depending on where the senior leader goes in, determines which kinds of decisions that they're helping their senior leaders make, or that they're making themselves. And this is the kind of decision making environments that we want to arm our students to be able to handle and we're we're doing our best at it but quite honestly we don't address all of these in our curriculum and it's it's something that i think is underrepresented some of these are underrepresented skip over that so now this brings me to my last point which is about the community of practice so just um 
we have a suite of uh, or a set of uh, professors working in my department, Department of Command Leadership and Management, uh, that work primarily on the defense management side. And what we are looking at are different ways in which we can build a knowledge base and a community that you know build interest in helping build tools that, uh, that help senior leaders navigate these particular types of problems. And in many cases, they're extensions of the work that was already presented earlier today. Now, for communities of practice, I want to be careful to differentiate um, communities of practice as really no kidding defined by Etienne Wenger in 1998 in his book versus what gets popularly talked about. Um, because community of practice sometimes sounds a little more than just another working group, but it really is something that's different. So I want to talk about that a bit. This is the actual definition, and it's not a necessarily a formal structure. It is just simply people getting together who share a particular passion. And we're those of us working in defense management are passionate about it because we recognize the importance of arming students with the tools to be able to make these kinds of decisions. So we sort of, uh, you know, we append DM to it. This middle part here in purple is what we're after. Not just being able to have students turn the crank to the bureaucracy and make it go faster, but to design new and innovative ways of doing business. Okay. A big part of this is that um, because of what I talked about in the beginning, where management is sort of second fiddle of leadership in a lot of ways, um, we don't see a lot of uh, officers who spend a lot of time on the enterprise side of things. They're sort of like this command track. Most, many of our students come in to the war college from the command track, and it becomes a shock to them as they leave and graduate. Maybe they'll get brigade command next, but most of them are going to spend the rest of their careers and beyond working on the enterprise side. And not everybody welcomes that idea. But it's really important to ensure that this community encourages the continued continued learning that allows us to build, you know, to continue, uh, develop these tools. Why is pretty obvious. I think I've uh, addressed this. We we want to emphasize that there is very much a leading people component to the management, especially when we start talking about. Uh, the need for mentorship. Mentorship is not just about navigating leader uh, leader issues, but it's also about business issues. And then how? Now, here's some initiatives that uh, we're doing, uh, undertaking now, and I'm just going to talk about two two steps that we're taking. One, building the knowledge base. Um, there's a whole range of management science that we're trying to build into our curriculum that uh, is, is, is gonna help us uh, because we haven't used management science as much as I think we, we could. Uh, we've actually established a repository which we're hoping will grow and grow rapidly to have, uh, to capture a lot of the information that's out there. There, isn't, there hasn't been one to this point. We do have the How the Army Runs, which is a biannual reference guide for how the, Ar the current Army process works. But when you go out there and try to find, say, what, how were decisions made in the past, there's a tendency on Department of Defense websites to uh, purge old versions of things. And for those of us who are really wanting to study the history of decisions over time, it gets really, really difficult. So what we're trying to do is we're building this library. Right now it's got, it's close to 2000 files in it, plus about a thousand hyperlinks. It was launched yesterday. So please, there's the website's right there. Please jump on it. And uh, if you have uh, some things to contribute, we're looking to populate the shelves. There's a lot of shelves that are uh, stubs. What's populated right now is mostly based on how we presently teach the uh, defense management uh, course. Uh, on War Room, uh, I mentioned the How the Army Runs guide. Uh, there's a website there to reference materials for practitioner guides that we produce. So for those of you who are looking for information about how to take 
business decisions and apply them to say the models that you're developing for character, for ethical decision making, whatever it is. The how the army runs is a pretty good place to start because it explains how the process currently works and in real good detail. And uh, we're also uh, building our own textbooks. As a matter of fact, we're, what I'm showing here is the first edition and the under development second edition of the defense management primer, which is a, a little black book that uh, soon to be a white book that uh, we hand out to students for them to take with them. Uh, this is especially useful for those who come to us with very little defense management experience up front. Okay, and then the other part of it is starting the conversation. I'm uh, honored to say that uh, we have started a podcast series on War Room. War Room is the official uh, online journal of the U.S. Army War College. And the podcast, there's a podcast series on it that we've started, just released the second episode on it yesterday, called How Should the Army Run? First episode was with Lou Yengert, who's the, uh, the primary inspiration for the series. And he talks about Department of Defense organization and Army organization. Uh, yesterday's episode was about uh, the physical management side of things. But this is going to cover just about anything on the business side of, um, of the defense enterprise. And uh, we're also trying to expand engagement. Uh, the Defense Management Institute is uh, something that's going to have a kickoff event. It's being uh, uh, I don't want to say too much about it because we're going to learn about it next week, but this is a separate initiative that's coming out of uh, the, the uh, SecDef's office uh, of wanting to look at the business, uh, the way that the, the business side of the enterprise runs. So there's, it's not just us, it's also other people who are recognizing the need to put this emphasis on management issues. And that was, uh, that was quite a bit. So uh, I'm, Welcome your questions. Thank you so much for your time. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. I think, yeah, there we go. Uh, Timothy Miller, U.S. Army War College. Um, thanks for your presentation, which is very So, um, two questions, but first, uh, check on. Uh, make sure if I understand check on learning. When I was involved in uh, communities of practice before, one of the concepts that was really critical was the function of the community in, in terms of self-regulation. So the question is, uh, based on your paper, is that what you would say is analogous to situated learning? And then, if so, within uh, the defense community of practice, how will uh, self-regulation in the community and the expert knowledge that's there be achieved over time? Thanks. Yeah, that, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, yes, uh, self-regulation is, is really important. And it, it's, it's self-regulation is, uh, for example, the defense against influences or bad habits that come in that negatively influence behaviors. So like, uh, for example, I, I, and I don't want to say bad habits in terms of like violations or mistakes made, but tendencies. Like I, I, I sort of said that organization structures are an easy button and they may not be the best lever to pull to solve a particular issue, but it unfortunately has that aura of action, right? It's, you know, we create a task force, we create an organization to do something. We are doing something. When in the end, that's the only thing it does is it makes, gives the appearance of doing something. It's almost like theater. So uh, when I think about self-regulation, it's, it's not just about um, preventing uh, improper behaviors or unauthorized behaviors or unethical behaviors. It is how do we get the organization to think more critically about the decisions it's about to make, about the levers it wants to pull, about the options available to it, especially for controversial issues where there probably is no good answer. No matter what you do, somebody is going to pay the price. And to be able to build a, um, an analytical culture within it 
that allows for whatever decision that's made to be better communicated. Again, going to openness and transparency, a theme that I heard in several presentations today. So that would be more of the aim. It's, it's self-regulation for what purpose? Um, thanks. So uh, to what extent is DM taught uh, in the fashion that you've described in the other war colleges? And then another question from that, uh, with an eye towards understanding the enterprise support for this community, uh, what does the Joint Staff J7 say about the importance of DM and our approach to its instruction? Thanks. Well, the thing is that uh, DM or what we would interpret as DM is not really explicitly identified as a joint learning area. So what happens is that it's left to the war colleges to interpret how they wish. Now, we, we have engaged with other war colleges, and I'm not privy to the inside of those uh, conversations, um, but it is our general understanding that uh, we probably spend more time in um, a breadth of issues on defense management in our curriculum more so than the other war colleges do, but different war colleges emphasize different things. Um, the Eisenhower School in particular focuses almost exclusively on modernization, for example. So it's all about interface with business, interface with the defense industry, how to make new products, whatever. I'm taking what is a much, much wider look at the whole range of decisions that the business side has to take to include the human dimension, uh, which, you know, again, the programmatic levers I, that I presented are not really explicitly talked about any, uh, anywhere so far as I know. Um, I know you know who I am, but Allison happened to be on my at the work volunteer. So my, my question for you is about I was interested in how you frame different definitions of what we think of as defense management. And for me, it raised the question of how should we think about traditional academic discipline and how they inform or engage with defense management, like public administration, science, and behavioral and social sciences. Uh, thank you for that, Allison. And uh, um, first off, uh, I know public. Uh, my background is uh, human and organization, uh, human and organizational learning, and um, and my deeper background is artificial intelligence and knowledge engineering. So I know I'm coming into this from somewhat more of a generalist perspective, um, and I would say that. Uh, in particular, management science and public administration are two fields that we could draw from a lot more in general. Because I think uh, one of the uh, one of the difficult one of the things that sort of drew me into this was the uh, routine instances where private sector type solutions are being brought into the public sector and they don't work. And I've been trying to figure out ways to explain why there's a systematic, there seems to be systematic problems. Not being a public administration scholar, it's very difficult for me to come up with a, I can explain it in practical terms. So I've, I've written about efficiency and how different sectors define efficiency. And boy, when it comes to business decisions, the word efficiency gets thrown around a lot. So certainly public administration, management science would be two fields that I think uh, would have a lot to contribute. Um, but certainly anything that we're talking about in this forum with, uh, with strategic leadership, there's a lot of applicability. It's just more context. You know, what is the decision that we want leaders to be better prepared for, for example? So I think there's a, there's a, there's, there's a, a really wide scope that we could tap into. Yeah, Richard, I like that. Very well done. I like the poetry plumbing thing, but it was a little bit different. Actually, in my head, I was kind of ready for more of the Eisenhower, you know, strategy without, you know, with, with our resources as a illusion or whatever. And it's kind of the yeah. 
you know, professionals talk or amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, really good professionals have to be able to talk about how you make strategy or make strategy and implement strategy. So you've got to have them connection. Why not go the other way? I, I like Allison's question in terms of thinking of the academic discipline, but one of the reasons the business stuff doesn't work for the military in my mind is it is a very different context. And on and this is the upscaling of logistics to my mind in some key ways. That we understand like logistics in a military fashion is completely different or very significantly different from the civilian world. Why why not why not that framing? Because I think even the military leaders tend to understand we can't fight without logistics. It's an American forte and it's an army forte more than the other services, I think, uh, or the way that the enterprise operates. Why not scale up the logistics narrative? Or you just cannot do operations or strategy without that. It, I suppose I was trying to do that in the way um, by focusing, you know, starting off with all of the, you know, the Russia-Ukraine example and the questions that have been surfaced by students that followed it. Those, um, you know, what about the def defense industrial base? What about the health of the all volunteer force? So I, I, I do agree, uh, we, we should start ultimately with the questions that we want to uh, want answered. You know, what is it that we want the enterprise to be able to do and to support the commander? And uh, it also has to do with, I think, uh, the boundary between what is the command responsibilities and what is the enterprise responsibilities, because that's something that's under constant negotiation. And if I made it to follow on, and I guess the other framing, and there's a book by Anthony King uh, out, of, uh, out of England, he was saying division command, and sort of went through this analysis that he used command as the jumping off point, not leadership per se. So, you know, the traditional division commander was a charismatic leader, a decision maker, but also knew everything about the organization that, uh, that, that was all the pieces of the division. And that was a historical artifact that is no longer true. The division commander, he was talking British and American combat divisions, yeah. still has to be the charismatic leader, still has to be the decision maker, but has to manage expertise of which he is not in command of, he or she is not in command of every aspect. And therefore, it is, and it's management is explicitly the word of youth. Why is that such a dirty word? When you know that's what happens when one, no one person can do it all themselves. Right. And I think uh, some of it is just cultural, you know, we just don't, we, we, we value leadership, we value command so much that management is just, you know, we find reasons to downplay it. But I, I'm glad you also mentioned command because, you know, in this talk, I was focused on the boundary between leadership and management. The command is its own third thing. You know, and I come from the Department of Command, Leadership and Management. So responsible command, is a construct all to its own, separate from leadership and separate from management. That is a subject for another day, but it is something that is um, that it's equally important. Hi, Tom. Uh, Jay Goodwin from the Army Research Institute. I appreciate very much your distinction here. Um, the question that I've been rolling around in my mind uh, centers on the, the strength of the bureaucracy as an organizational form within DOD and within the Army. Part of the reason that we know tiger teams and working groups and task forces ultimately fail within the Army and DOD to accomplish much is because the bureaucratic organizational form has very strong antibodies to other organizational forms. So if we were to reconceive, going back to your Title 10 very beginning chart, we can see and start from scratch to say, all right, these are the, the responsibilities. How do we design organizations that can do that if we're not allowed to do an or if we're not allowed to use a bureaucratic organizational form? How do we get there? Dream it like green field yeah. design. Well, the trouble is that you can't avoid bureaucracy because you have to be able to recognize what are routine activities. And that's one of the good sides of bureaucracy. So part of this is to separate the good parts of bureaucracy from the ossified bad parts of bureaucracy. Those things that really do get in the way. Um, and yeah, it's it, it would be a fun exercise to start from a whiteboard, but I think uh, actually the force uh, organizational design narrative is where I would start. The four parts of it were roles and missions, 
So what are the responsibilities and what is the smart way to divide the labor, recognizing that the division's not going to be clean? Then you got to think about this, uh, basically the scope, their size and organization. Um, how, how much energy, how much resources, how many people is it to perform those divided you know, aspects of labor? And how do you replicate it? Do you centralize or decentralize, for example? Um, and we go back and forth with centralization and decentralization a lot with you know, centralizing for efficiency, decentralizing for flexibility. So you have to decide how you're going to apportion resources against those uh, roles and missions, how they're divided. And then where do you put it? If you're going to centralize it, then it means the place that you're going to centralize it at has got to be at an appropriate place. It's a, it's a question that we wrestle with all the time every time we create a headquarters. Or do you disperse it? Put local offices in different places, which is great for responsiveness. Um, commander has access to the goods and services or whatever that's provided, but then you end up with uh, problems of uh, the lack of economy of scale, right? So all of those, that would be the whiteboard exercise that I would initiate. Do we have any chat? Just Johnson here. Hey, Tom, this was excellent. I think you started a great discussion and maybe brought a few members into our community of practice. I want to thank you on behalf of the whole uh, um, conference for your presentation. Um, we got three minutes till we're over, so we're just going to end now. But I want to say that was awesome. And don't forget, they got free munchies. Somebody's been over at 1757. Uh, I encourage you to drive because the field will be fun. All's good. Thanks. And I'm happy to stick around. Right